So let's begin and talk about Jackson's administration and the nullification crisis. Where we last left off, we were talking about Andrew Jackson as a man of the people. And if we recall, the election of 1828 is commonly regarded as a turning point in the political history of the United States. As a man of the people, Jackson was the first president born in poverty. He soon became the largest landholder in Tennessee. He had always kept that frontiersman prejudice against the people of wealth. Jackson was also the first president from an area west of the Appalachian Mountains and indicated westward movement as the center of political power. He was the first man to be elected president through direct appeal to the masses of voters rather than the support of recognized political organization. Thus, Jackson benefited from a rising tide of democratic sentiment, a trend that was aided by the admission of 60 states to the Union, five of which had manhood suffrage. And as the power of the older political organizations weakened, the way was open for the rise of new political leaders skilled in appealing to the masses of voters. It is regarded as a maker of the modern presidency. Even though Jackson had no well-defined program of action when he entered the presidency, Jackson did bring to the presidency a new set of personal qualifications that were to become a standard by which presidential candidates would be judged from the remainder of the 19th century. He was the first president since George Washington, who had not served a long apprenticeship in public life and had no personal experience in the formulation or conduct of foreign policy. His periods of service in Congress provided no clue to his stand on the public issues of the day, except perhaps in a tariff, which he was in favor of a lower tariff. Yet Jackson approached the problems of the presidency as he approached all other problems in his life. He met each issue as it arose and exhibited the same vigor and determination in carrying out decisions that had characterized his conduct as commander of an army. He made it clear from the outset that he would be master of his own administration, and at times he was so strong-willed and decisive in making decisions and policies for the nation. So what was Jackson's administration all about? Well, we'll first begin by talking about the idea of rotation of office. Remember, when Jackson was elected to power, he had a lot of supporters, and the belief was that a removal of office holders of the rival party would occur and new ones would be put in. This idea is known as the spoil system, where your political supporters would be rewarded a public office and jobs in government. Well, now, the explanation Jackson gave was that he was reforming the government, of trying to create a more efficient system where a chain of command and public employees uh, would obey the higher entities of government. However, Jackson, in the end, uh, the impact will be rather mixed. Okay. About 45% of the government over his tenure in office changed, but a lot of that was because of retirement or people dying on a job. And the quality of public officials that were placed very often were people who were more loyal to Jackson and the Democratic Party as opposed to somebody who was most qualified for the position. Now, Jackson's administration uh, most had headlines within the cabinet. Jackson's cabinet was more or less uh, often record reflected by historians as a rather mediocre cabinet. The only person with real talent was Martin Van Buren, a person we're going to talk about later on in future president of the United States. Martin Van Buren was the Secretary of State for Jackson. And John C. Calhoun, another character which we're going to talk about, was his vice president. And the two of them, Calhoun and Bur Van Buren, very often were at odds with each other. Yet the rest of the people in the cabinet were very much yes men and buddies of Jackson, that uh, would fall along uh, those who would support Jackson eventually and those who support Calhoun. Now, for Jackson, he relied more on his kitchen cabinet. These were more advisors to the president. A lot of them were newspapermen as well as other uh, people in various businesses that Jackson would consult with and you more or less use uh, to get his message across to the public and reach to the public more directly. And he also then consulted with them and relied on them more than his official cabinet, which created more or less uh, friction between the cabinet, the official cabinet members, and the ones that Jackson really trusted, which is the kitchen cabinet. All this kind of falls apart uh, and is reflected in a controversy and a scandal that occurred in the, early, in the first term of Jackson's presidency, otherwise known as the Petticoat Affair or the Peggy Eaton Affair. Peggy Eaton was the daughter of a Washington tavern keeper who was married to a Navy pursuer by the name of John B. Timberlake. Throughout the 1820s, her name was linked with Tennessee Senator John H. Eaton, a close friend of Jackson. When uh, Peggy O'Neill's husband died in 1828, Eaton, with Jackson's approval, would marry her, and Jackson made him the Secretary of War. 
A few weeks after the wedding, rumors about Peggy Eaton's misconduct spread in Washington, and Washington hostesses, including the wives of cabinet members, would snub her. Though some observers believed that a majority of her sin lay in her humble social origins. Now, Jackson was outraged when the wife of the pres- vice president, John C. Calhoun, took the lead in Peggy's ostracism. Van Buren, then Secretary of State and a widower himself, made a point of being gracious to her, and a stock rose in the president's as Calhoun's fell. The beginning of the estrangement between Jackson and Calhoun, which we'll talk about more later on, but it showed this controversy uh, reflects Jackson's um, determination to be loyal to those who are most loyal to him. And uh, Eaton being loyal to Jackson, Jackson got his back in supporting his wife, Peggy Eaton, in this affair. Now, mind you, remember, Jackson's wife had died um, at, soon after Jackson became president. And Jackson, if you recall, blamed those who were very critical of their relationship uh, and the question of infidelity in his, early, in his marriage. And so this struck close to Jackson's heart, and he sided with Peggy in, in this instance. Now, this scandal and controversy aside uh, is the backdrop to the bigger issue, which we're going to talk about today, the nullification crisis. And to begin with, we have to consider a couple of facts uh, before we get into the issue more in depth. The first is the idea of a tariff. This issue was constantly being debated within Congress year after year, and sectional interests between the North and the South uh, continuously are are coming uh, to a blow. And the tariff that was passed in 1828 before Jackson took office would be the largest and highest protective tariff in American history. Uh, Some would refer to it as a tariff of abominations. More on that in a few seconds. The other thing, too, that is emerging in Jackson's first term as president is the argument between federal powers and state powers. What authority do the federal have? What about the state? Uh, How do they balance out? Who has authority in certain matters? In addition... There's also that rivalry that I mentioned briefly between the president and the vice president, between Jackson and John C. Calhoun, which we're going to go into more in a few seconds. So to begin with, I want to talk about the idea of tariffs a little more, and particularly looking at the different sections of the country and the different economic interests that the country had. If you recall, tariffs was definitely favored by northerners, uh, particularly by uh, industries and manufacturing because it's protecting against foreign competition. Now, in doing so, because uh, American businesses were protected, American businesses saw it in their interest in order to maximize profits to raise the prices of their goods uh, a little higher, but not as high as their competition, um, the foreign competition with the tariffs. Now, Southerners complained that uh, high tariffs was detrimental to them. They preferred low tariffs. And they believed uh, in low tariffs because their problem was that their wealth came from cotton. And cotton prices basically stayed the same. And northern manufacturing goods had risen. And they saw this as an unfair thing because the, the burden of tariffs and taxes was on the shoulders of Southerners. Now, John C. Calhoun would emerge as a key figure in this moment. If you recall, John C. Calhoun started off his career in politics as a nationalist. Elected from South Carolina, he served um, as one of the War Hawks and teamed up with Henry Clay in pushing through nationalist policies after the War of 1812. However, John C. Calhoun aspires to be president. He became the Secretary of War under James Monroe, and then later became the Vice President for John Quincy Adams, dropping out of the election of 1824 when he realized the field was too crowded. And so he became the Vice President for John Quincy Adams. And he also now is the Vice President for Andrew Jackson. However, during this uh, Jackson administration, you see a clear shift towards uh, becoming a states' rights activist from South Carolina. Now, as he evolved into a sectionalist, Jackson, John C. Calhoun saw this as, in his interest in order to gain the presidency by gaining Southern support. Since uh, basically every president has been from the South, he wanted to secure that support. So... John C. Calhoun helps to uh, articulate and develop further the theory of nullification, uh, particularly uh, in a uh, pamphlet that was published called the South Carolina Exposition that was critical of northern industrial interests and the support of the tariff and claiming that southerners were being slaves to these northern interests. This was published anonymously. However, Jack, however, Calhoun built his theory of nullification on Jefferson and Madison's argument 
they from the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. So let's get into it. So what is a nullification concept again? Well, the first thing is that nullification uh, theorists believe that the U.S. Constitution is based on a compact of 13 sovereign states, meaning the 13 states agreed to join together under the U.S. Constitution. Now, being sovereign states, states had a right to decide whether an act of Congress was constitutional or not. That is their constitutional right. If they thought that an act was not constitutional, every state has the right to declare a law null and void, and thus does not apply within their state, and thus they do not have to enforce that law. So, And the reason why Calhoun and nullification theorists believed in this idea is that if states don't have this right, the majority might trample over minority rights. And states like South Carolina, who were in the minority against the tariff, felt that their rights were being trampled on by the tariff of abominations. And in January of 1830, the most celebrated debates in the Senate's history emerged, particularly a tariff debate that would really become a debate about the idea of nullification and what exactly is the United Union or the United States. And pitted in this debate are two senators, uh, Senator Robert Hayne of South Carolina and Senator Daniel Webster of Massachusetts. And Robert Hayne uh, put out the first volley. And in arguing against the tariff, he basically argued very similar to what the South Carolina Exposition did, which is that Southern planters were slaves to Northern industrials. And you could take this at whatever face value you want. Obviously, uh, it's kind of a ridiculous comparison considering Southern planters own slaves, but this is the language he's using. And the reason being is that they believe that the rights of Southerners are being destroyed by this tariff. And in order to be restored, they have to get rid of the tariff. And so nullification, Robert Haynes would argue, is a safeguard of the states to protect their minority interests. This is all subtext for defending slavery. More or less, defending Southern rights uh, with the tariff is really code for defending slavery down the line. But we're going to leave that issue for another time to discuss. Now, Daniel Webster would give a reply, and we're going to give a few minutes to listen to this. I profess, sir, in my career hitherto, to have kept steadily in view the prosperity and honor of the whole country and the preservation of our federal union. It is to that union we owe our safety at home and our consideration and dignity abroad. It is to that union that we are chiefly indebted for whatever makes us most proud of our country. Every year of its duration has teemed with fresh proofs of its utility and its blessings. And although our territory has stretched out wider and wider, and our population spread farther and farther, they have not outrun its protection or its benefits. It has been to us all a copious fountain of national, social, and personal happiness. I have not allowed myself, sir, to look beyond the Union, to see what might lie hidden in the dark recess behind. I have not coolly weighed the chances of preserving liberty when the bonds that unite us together shall be broken asunder. I have not accustomed myself to hang over the precipice of disunion to see whether with my short sight, I can fathom the depth of the abyss below. Nor could I regard him as a safe counselor in the affairs of this government, whose thoughts should be mainly bent on considering not how the union shall be best preserved, but how tolerable might be the condition of the people when it shall be broken up and destroyed. While the union lasts, we have high, exciting, gratifying prospects spread out before us, for us and our children. Beyond that, I seek not to penetrate the veil. God grant that on my vision never may be opened what lies behind. When my eyes shall be turned to behold, for the last time, the sun in heaven. May I not see him shining on the broken and dishonored fragments 
of a once glorious union. On states dissevered, discordant, belligerent, on a land rent with civil feuds, or drenched it may be in fraternal blood. Let their last feeble and lingering glance rather behold the gorgeous ensign of the Republic, now known and honored throughout the earth, still full high advanced, its arms and trophies streaming in their original luster, not a stripe erased or polluted, nor a single star obscured, bearing for its motto no such miserable interrogatory as what is all this worth, nor those other words of delusion and folly, liberty first and union afterwards, but everywhere, spread all over in characters of living light, blazing on all its ample folds as they float over the sea and over the land, and in every wind under the whole heavens, that other sentiment dear to every true American heart, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. So what is Webster getting at here? Well, Webster is talking about the union and talking about the union equals prosperity for America. And the more united we are, the more prosperous the United States is. And his reply to Haynes goes to the heart by what exactly is the Constitution? What is the United States? And he says in another part of his speech, I go for the Constitution as it is and for the union as it is. It's the people's Constitution and a people's government made for the people by the people answerable to the people, looking at the first words of the Constitution, meaning we the people. The union is more of a compact between people, not the sovereign states. And thus, the union and a national government's laws are supreme than that of the states. If states don't like it, they have a process. And within that constitutional process, they have the courts. If states don't like a law, they can go to court with it. If they don't like it, you have the electoral process and have to work through it uh, and work through the system to change what you don't like. But ultimately, what got Webster's go about what Haynes was talking about is to talk about how this idea of liberty and union, that if liberty is not protected, that the union will fall apart and that the union would separate it. And again, this is subtext for this idea that states believe that if it's the union is not working for them, they have the right to leave, hence break away, hence secession, hence in the future, this idea of, of civil war and breaking apart. And Webster heard this and saw this and knew that this is why he said at the end, liberty and union, now and forever, inseparable. For us to have liberties, we have to be unified. Without the unity, we're no longer going to be free. Now, this debate is raging, um, more or less, so to speak, in uh, the Senate. However, the friction between Jackson and Calhoun will hit um, definitely uh, into explosive measures uh, in the context of this, uh, all these events in Washington. Now, this be evolves into a deeper personal conflict. And uh, a few weeks after the webster hain debate, there's a White House dinner where Jackson gives a toast. And in that toast, Jackson says, our union, it must be preserved. And Calhoun quickly followed with this, the union next to our liberty most dear. May we always remember that can be only preserved by distributing equally the benefits and burden of union. Jackson is laying out the unionist argument. Calhoun is laying out the secessionist or uh, sectionalist argument, uh, the nullification argument. Jackson heard that very clearly uh, within his uh, toast and definitely was angered by Calhoun's uh, uh, toast. Now, Calhoun's stance in nullification all beca also becomes uh, more public within cabinet meetings where Calhoun would fess up as being the author of the South Carolina exposition. In addition, uh, it is revealed uh, through other cabinet members, that John C. Calhoun, back in the day when he was the Secretary of War, had sought to perhaps punish Jackson for his actions in Florida. Jackson becomes aware of this now and is further enraged. And you throw on top of that the petticoat affair or Peggy Eaton affair, and more or less the two gentlemen themselves uh, saw that this relationship was no longer tenable between the president and the vice president. So much so that 
Uh, Calhoun would resign as vice president by 1832, as well as many other cabinet officials would be dismissed by Jackson, particularly those who are most loyal to uh, John C. Calhoun, and you have a reshuffling of the cabinet, uh, as mocked by the cartoon in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide. So by 1832, things definitely heat up in what is now officially the nullification crisis. Now, in 1832, Congress passes a tariff. This tariff actually lowered the 1828 tariff. However, South Carolinians are, still think it's way too high. And so they want they hold a nullification convention. They nullify this tariff. They nullify the tariff 1828. And they basically say, we will not collect any tariff of goods coming into the state of South Carolina from foreign ports. And so thus, nullification is in effect. Jackson denounces this nullification by South Carolina, his home state. He sees this as an act of treason, an act of treason against the federal government. And the old warrior in Jackson, when you see treason, you hang him up high. And apparently in cabinet meetings, Jackson said, I'm going to hang those nullification people down in South, North South Carolina. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing, but that is the feeling Jackson had. Now, Jackson knew he had kind of two options he could pursue. He could go with the hammer or he could go with the olive branch. And so he pursues both options through Congress. He is able to get passed through Congress in 1832, 1833, something referred to as a force bill, basically giving Jackson the authority to use military force to enforce the law. Uh, the South Carolinian uh, government also nullified to this, by the way, but Jackson now has the authority through the force bill to use military force uh, in order to force South Carolina to collect the tariffs, to send troops in there, down to South Carolina. And Jackson is assembling a force to send down there. But at the same time, Jackson is working with Congress and behind the scenes to try to reduce the tariff rate, to try to work through a resolution, legislatively speaking, that may be satisfactory to South Carolina. And so who steps up now uh, in Congress to make a big deal? Well, none other than Henry Clay. Henry Clay is able to push through a compromise uh, that would satisfy all the parties uh, one way or another. And this is referred to as the Compromise of 1833. Basically, it was a promise that the tariff of 1832, or will gradually uh, reduce by 10% over 10 years. South Carolinians would repeal their ordinance and nullification soon afterwards, and a crisis of uh, secession more or less is averted, uh, and any bloodshed here. Now, we may look back on this and say, well, what's the big deal? Nothing really happened. Well, it's more or less uh, looking at a grand scheme of things. So what is the significance of this nullification crisis uh, under Jackson's administration? Well, first and foremost, whatever the motives Jackson had, Jackson does preserve the integrity of the Union and standing behind the Union. As the uh, chief executive whose job is to enforce the law, he's going to enforce the law. Even though he may not agree with the law, he, saw, uh, he stood up to the most serious threat uh, that the government had faced. However, the issue of federal and state laws, still, these issues still have not been settled with this. In addition, there's no clear winner who the, uh, wins in this issue. South Carolina feels like they win. Uh, because they got a reduction in tariff. Henry Clay seems like a winner because he came up with a compromise. Jackson uh, now uh, feels he's a, uh, a winner in this because he's able to uh, keep South Carolina from enforcing its nullification. And John C. Calhoun also sees as a, uh, a winner because he becomes the senator from South Carolina, who would serve there for many, many years, uh, defending South rights, uh, Southern rights, as well as the expansion of slavery into the other territories. Uh, and then... The question also, uh, historians often debate, is whether or not this could have been a civil war. Uh, was this a cause of the civil war? Did it prevent a civil war? Did it delay a civil war? Either way, uh, this issue of nullification uh, is groundwork for future arguments that will develop between North and South and is really a reflection of the sectional divisions that Jackson uh, had to deal with as President of the United States. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.